Friday has arrived. Is everybody aware of that? What Friday? What's Friday, right? All right. We've got material to get through. Uh, exams are starting. Exam is starting to loom big in our in our event horizon, as it were. Uh, that the first exam of the course will be a week from Monday. Oh joy, huh? So um, I'll say more about that next week. Uh, we'll have a review session at some point, um, and um, I hope to uh, have information about that for you soon. Um, Today I'm going to finish up with hemoglobin, and I hope I convinced you last time that hemoglobin was a pretty amazing protein, and that there are many structural aspects to hemoglobin that allow it to do what it does. And understanding something about those structural elements, or the structural considerations in hemoglobin, allow you to begin to better understand how it is that enzymes function. I want to emphasize that hemoglobin is not an enzyme. Okay. Enzymes catalyze reactions, and there's no reaction being catalyzed by hemoglobin. Its sole function is, carry, is, is, is carrying oxygen and dropping it off where it's needed. Okay. So it's not catalyzing a reaction, but in some ways the structural considerations that we have for hemoglobin carry over into enzymes, and we'll see how that happens um, uh, very, very shortly. Well, there's one last thing about hemoglobin that I want to mention, um, as if it wasn't remarkable enough as it was. Uh, to think about, and that um, actually relates to sickle cell anemia. Okay, so sickle cell anemia is a genetic um, disorder that arises uh, from. Uh, it can actually arise in a variety of ways. A variety of different mutations in hemoglobin can give rise to sickle cell anemia. The uh, blood cell that here is shown here in sort of a yellowish color is a uh, blood cell that would be found in an individual that has sickle cell anemia. And this sickle shape uh, arises as a result of low oxygen concentration. Well, where would a blood cell encounter low blood cell or blow, low oxygen concentration? That would happen, of course, in any uh, tissue where a person is, at, well, where the tissue is actively respiring, and generally this would occur, let's say, in muscle tissue, and specifically it would occur in the capillaries because this is the place where there's interaction between the um, hemoglobin component and the oxygen, and of course the cells that are taking up that oxygen. This is exactly the wrong place for this blood cell to assume this this form because this sickle shape that you see right here isn't nice and rounded and smooth. It gets stuck in capillaries. It gets stuck in capillaries. Well, when it gets stuck in capillaries, it plugs up capillaries. And since capillaries are primary uh, places where oxygen is being dropped off, those muscle cells that were relying on hemoglobin for oxygen are suddenly starved for oxygen. Okay. Not surprisingly, uh, sickle cell anemia is a debilitating disease. It causes a person to have problems with heavy exertion. The disease itself can be fatal, as you could imagine, if you were unable to supply oxygen as needed for a period of time. It's called an anemia because anemias are diseases that relate to the um, shortage of red blood cells. And what happens with this is once this guy has assumed this sickle shape, the body looks at it and says, oh, we've got a damaged blood cell. We take it out of action. Okay, And so it takes out of action blood cells that would otherwise be normal and functional. And as a consequence, since a lot of these, especially during periods of heavy exertion, appear in this form, the person's blood count is always going to be low. They're, produce, they're, they're uh, always scrambling to produce enough uh, red blood cells to satisfy demand. So it's a very debilitating uh, disease. The reason the sickle shape forms is because the hemoglobin within this blood cell will actually form polymers. That is, they form long, long concatamers of hemoglobin units, one after the other after the other, 
and change the shape of the hemoglobin. In this normal red blood cell that we can see on the right, hemoglobin is individu hemoglobins are individual units. They're not polymers. So these polymers cause this sickling shape to happen. And the polymers happen because of some very simple mutations that occur in the coding for hemoglobin. That is the globin part of the hemoglobin. Okay. Well, that's, uh, as we can imagine, uh, pretty uh, nasty. Here you can see some of those polymers um, here a little uh, more closely, and that's exactly what's um, happening inside or associated with this portion of the red blood cell. And um, one of the questions people ask with almost any disease is, well, why does this disease persist in the human population? This is a genetic disease, and if people are carrying it, there must, be, there must be some reason why it hasn't been eliminated from the human population by the, by the process of selection. Okay? Um, and it turns out that um, when, when uh, researchers examined the um, incidence of sickle cell anemia around the world in terms of numbers, and they compared that to a variety of um, other uh, diseases around the world, what they found was that the disease of malaria overlaid very similarly the two maps, the, the map of sickle cell anemia. Okay? Now, sickle cell anemia can strike, or it, it, it's, it, it doesn't occur just in uh, people in sub Saharan Africa, but it's more predominant in areas of the tropics that you see uh, shown here in yellow. Uh, I'm sorry, shown here in, in the sort of reddish. Okay? Um, and um, so it can occur anywhere, all right? So it's not just in that one place. But the high incidence of it here suggests that there might be some selective advantage to having at least the sickle cell anemia gene. And it turns out that there is, all right? So the sickle cell anemia gene is a recessive trait. So it takes two recessives to give the full sickle cell anemia uh, phenotype. That phenotype turns out to be the one that is very problematic. It's very, um, uh, can be deadly, can be very debilitating. But people who are heterozygous, who have one normal allele and one uh, mutant allele, that is sickle cell anemia, appear to have a selective advantage, particularly when they're young. They're inc the incidence of death due to malaria for people who are heterozygous for sickle cell anemia um, is, is lower. Okay. So there is some selective advantage. The organism that infects people and causes um, malaria is dependent upon oxygen. And so it may well be that the uh, problem, that, that, that what we see as a problem is actually an advantage uh, in terms of what this organism that's requiring oxygen is actually needing and doing. So there may be some advantage to having um, the allele, at least in heterozygous form. Yes? Yeah. And um, his doctor had told him I like, can't be in any unpressurized aircraft or yep. anything like that. And I was wondering, yeah. is it because some of the hemoglobin is still you know, changing form, like someone that was homozygous, which is not as extreme? Or what, what yeah. is the big difference? It's just not as large of a percentage of cells that are doing that? Yeah. Um, I, to be honest with you, I probably can't and shouldn't answer that question. And the reason is, is that uh, there are people who sue you for medical purposes. Oh. <laughs> and so um, much as I would like to give you my opinion on that, I probably shouldn't do that. And since people all over do watch these videos, I, I, I apologize. I, I, I generally will, will avoid uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, but if you want to come by and talk, I'd be happy yeah, to talk to you about that. that told us this, yeah. but, you know, they, they assumed we wouldn't understand, and so they didn't want to go into the details or anything. Well, so. yes. Yes. Question back there? Uh, you know, I don't know, David, uh, the answer to that question. I, I don't know which, which one corresponds to that. I'm sorry. Okay. So that's hemoglobin, um, an absolutely fascinating protein. We're going to turn our attention now to some other absolutely fascinating proteins in their own way. And these are enzymes. So enzymes, of course, are proteins that catalyze reactions. And um, enzymes are incredible, okay? Well, hemoglobin, I told you, was incredible. And when I use the term incredible, I hope I have some credibility, haha, for you with respect. Thank you. With respect to that. You're laughing already, right? 
Maybe what I should do instead of this is, is, is do our song early instead of do our song late since you're already in a laughing mode. Would that, would that work? Okay, let's do the song early. So the song actually relates to hemoglobin, so maybe it's appropriate we do it at this time. Um, and it's to the tune of an old song uh, that Coca-Cola used to sell Coca-Cola with. It's, called, it's the real thing. You guys know the song? I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. Right? You can try it, all right? Try it with me. It's called The Bloody Things. I'm gonna put some oxygens beside my poor friend rings to nudge the irons up a notch and yank on histidines. The globe and shapes will change a bit. Oh, what a sight to see. The way they bind to oxygen cooperatively. And as I exit from the lungs to swim in the bloodstream, metabolizing cells, they all express their needs to me. To them I give up oxygen and change from R to T. While my amines, they hang on to the protons readily. But that's not all the tricks I know. There's more that's up my sleeve. Like gaps between subunits that hold 2, 3, BPG. When near metabolizing cells, I bind things that diffuse the protons and bicarbonates from lowly CO2s. That's the way it is when your cells are at play. Go say hip, hip, hooray for the bloody things. Go say hip, hip, hooray. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So we got our song out of our system. That's good there, right? All right, coming back, to cat, coming back to enzymes. Enzymes are, um, uh, as I said, remarkable proteins. Um, and I want to just give you a little bit of a, a, of a glimpse of that. We take them for granted, OK? So let's look at the rate of enhancement of a variety of enzymatic reactions. There's a lot of information there, OK? But let's look to see at some of these, these uh, different reactions that are catalyzed. So here's an enzyme called OMP decarboxylase, all right? We'll talk about it uh, next term when we talk about how nucleotides are made, all right? This enzyme catalyzes a reaction that if we were to uh, uh, look at the same reaction in the absence of the enzyme, the half-life of that reaction would be 78 million years. Okay? 78 million years. All right? Now, when we look at what this enzyme does when we add it to the solution, the enzyme catalyzes the reaction at the rate of 39 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. All right? Well, if we do the math and we calculate all this, what we discover is that this is an enhancement. That is, how many times faster it's actually doing it. The enhancement is 1.4 times 10 to the 17th. That is 140 quadrillion times faster. Okay? A chemical catalyst like platinum is pretty good if it speeds things up 100 to 1,000 fold. And here's something that's speeding up something 140 quadrillion times faster than the, the same reaction in the absence of the enzyme. That's pretty hard to get your head around. There's other things about enzymes that are hard to get your head around. Okay? We'll talk more about this column over here later, but I want to show you something about the last enzyme on the list, carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes a reaction that normally doesn't take that long to go through, but look at how many molecules of product it makes per molecule of enzyme per second. What does that mean? This says that this enzyme will produce 1 million molecules of product per molecule of enzyme every second. I take one enzyme molecule, I take the, the things it catalyzes, and one million of them will be converted into product per second. That's pretty hard to get your head around. All right? That's pretty hard to get your head around. We think about computers operating really fast, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a molecular process that's occurring, okay, like a computer. 
a million molecules of product per second for every single enzyme that's in that solution. Okay? Well, this is so hard for us to get our heads around. I, used to, I like to use this as an example of the fact that when we think about things at the nanoscopic scale, we're really thinking about a different kind of world than what we live in. There's nothing out here in the world that we live in that we can experience that gives us a million things per second. Mole enzymes are really remarkable. Well, because they're so remarkable and, so beca and, and because they're so much more remarkable than chemical catalysts, we have to understand how it is that enzymes accomplish the magic that they accomplish. Okay? All right. To do that, we need to give some considerations to what's known as free energy. You guys took free energy when you took your freshman chemistry, probably in your last term. And you probably went, oh my god, right? And you're probably sitting here now thinking the same thing, because now he's going to make us do more calculations, all right? Well, for what I'm going to talk about here, we're not going to really do much in the way of calculations. We will do some calculations related to free energy later when we talk about metabolism. Right now, our consideration of free energy is simply related to what's here and how free energy plays into what enzymes do, okay? So free energy is energy that is available for useful purposes, okay? Useful purposes. So we understand the free energy of a reaction. Basically, we can understand if a reaction is feasible or not feasible. Now, I'm going to give you a little heads up here. And you probably learned this in freshman chemistry, but you didn't remember it. Enzymes and catalysts, they're both catalysts, do not change the overall free energy of a reaction. They do not change the overall free energy of a react, excuse me, of a reaction. Okay? So all the changes that happen do not relate to the overall free energy. That's important to understand. Well, I think you probably learned in freshman chemistry that the delta G, which is the change in free energy for a given reaction, tells us or allows us to predict what the direction a reaction will go. If the delta G uh, for a reaction is negative, that is less than zero, the reaction will go forwards as it's written. If the delta G for a reaction is equal to zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. If the delta G for a reaction is positive, the reaction will go backwards as written. Three very simple rules. One not so simple rule, notice the last point there. Equilibrium does not mean equal concentration of reactants and products. The most common misconception that I deal with, that seniors in, in science would still think this is remarkable to me. Don't make that assumption. Don't fall into that trap. Equilibrium does not mean equal concentrations of reactants and products. Okay? Now. That's, those simple rules right there, as I said, allow us to predict the direction of a reaction. If we look at the equation that allows us to calculate the free energy for a reaction, we see that that equation is right here. Okay? You notice in that equation that there's another term that looks like delta G, and it's labeled as delta G zero prime. That's a big zero, and that's a prime over there. It says that the overall free energy for a reaction, which is the delta G, is equal to the delta G zero prime plus R, the gas constant R, times the temperature, times the natural log of the concentration of the products over the reactants. That's what it says. I'm going to explain that to you, but that's what it says, okay? What that says is that the delta G is equal to a different kind of delta G plus the concentration, the, plus this term times the concentration of, of, of products and reactants. Okay? This equation looks very foreign, but it, this equation is almost identical to Henderson Hasselbach. pH, which is something we can measure, is equal to a constant, which is pKa. This guy right here turns out to be a constant for a given reaction also. Plus the log, all right, well, this is a natural log, of, of the concentration of salt over acid. Okay? 
It's the same equation. It's the same basic idea that you've learned in Henderson Hasselbach that you work with in this equation. Now, we're not going to do equations at this point. We're not going to do calculations at this point, so I'm not going to go through that any further. I will come and talk about this more when we discuss it later. All right? When we discuss uh, meta uh, metabolism later. All right. So, what I do want to introduce, however, is the concept of energy with respect to chemical reactions. Okay? So, let's um, take what, we've, uh, what, what I've just introduced about energy and think about how enzymes work. Okay? Well, that's not the one I want. The one I want is right the next one. Okay? This is a really dandy figure. It actually shows us everything about how enzymes work. Everything. Okay? Let's look at it. I'm going, to I'm going to describe it to you in mathematical terms, and then I'm going to give you a more uh, real-world kind of a description. Okay? So notice that we are plotting, in this case, the free energy versus the reaction progress. When we look at this graph, we see the free energy of the material to start with, and we see the free energy of the product, and the delta G, that is the change in free energy, is the difference between this right here and this down here. That is the difference between the energy of the substrate and the energy of the product. Okay. Now, you'll notice that we see two things going on here. We see in the solid line a reaction that is uncatalyzed. No enzyme, no catalyst. We see that during the course of the reaction, the formation of what we call the transition state causes the free energy to increase to a significant amount. Once it gets over that hump, it goes down here and makes product. This might be two molecules bumping into each other with the right energy. This might be two molecules bumping into each other with the right energy and the right orientation. All right? And this amount of energy is necessary to get the reaction started. Okay? We see that if we add an enzyme, we see a different situation. We start at the same energy level, but instead of having to go up this hump right here, we go up, up a much lower hump, and we produce the same product that has the same energy. The energy change for the, um, for the enzyme-catalyzed reaction is identical to the energy change for the enzyme, for the non-enzyme-catalyzed reaction. Okay? The enzyme didn't change the overall free energy, but during that reaction, there were some things that changed. Right? The real world analogy I have to this is I always like to have the, the class envision the following scenario. Imagine, if you will, that we are at about 300 feet above sea level right here in Corvallis. Okay? And sea level, of course, is zero feet because that's what sea level is, right? In theory, we should be able to take a giant ball bearing that's the size of about half the size of this room and push it in the direction of either the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean, and it would get there. Because we're higher than what that, those oceans are, right? The overall change is going to be 300 feet, and we know that things roll downhill. But we also know, as we think about it, that it's not a straight going down the slope to the, either the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. We know that along the way there are hills, and so forth as we go over there. So if you wanted to make sure that thing got to the Pacific Ocean, you would say, well, let's take this ball bearing as a class, and we're all going to push this ball bearing, and we assume we don't have trees and so forth in the way. If we have enough clear cutting, we'll have that happen, I suppose. But if we, if we take all this ball bearing and we push it up to the top of Mary's Peak, all right, that's the tallest peak in the area. We know that if it gets up there, it'll go down and up and down and down and down, and finally, it'll arrive at the ocean. And that'll work, as long as obviously nothing's blocking its path. Right? What I just described to you is what a non-enzymatic reaction does. It takes it to the highest place where there's no turning back, and then it goes down that path, ultimately down to the ocean. What enzymes do is they say, well, why should I go to the top of Mary's Peak? That's going to be the hardest place for me to push that ball bearing. All I need to do is push it up to the pass and get it to that point. I push it to the pass, the highest pass that I need to get to, and it'll do the same thing. Enzymes are therefore lowering 
the energy necessary to get to that transition state. And by doing so, they enable many, many more molecules to get to that transition state. This transition state, as I noted, is essential for the reaction to, to proceed. Okay. Questions about that? Delta G is exactly the same for both. Delta G does not change for an enzymatic reaction. And that means that, therefore, an enzyme will not change the equilibrium for a reaction. It will not change the equilibrium. It's completely unchanged. Now, what we see here is that what an enzyme is doing is it's transiently changing the free energy of the intermediate. It's transiently doing that. And that turns out to be a really interesting phenomenon. Okay? A really interesting phenomenon. All right. How does the enzyme manage to do that? And how does it manage to do that so much better than a catalyst? A catalyst will also lower the transition energy for a reaction. That's how a catalyst works as well, a non-enzyme uh, reaction. All right? But it doesn't do it as well as an enzyme does. What's so magical about an enzyme? Well, when people used to study biochemistry, they used to think there were all kinds of magical things about biochemistry because things happened inside of cells that really didn't seem to make any sense outside of cells. Well, we know, of course, now that the chemical reactions that occur inside of cells are no different than those outside of cells. The delta Gs don't change. The rates may change, and we have to understand how it is that the rates of those reactions change. Well, I said that a non-chemical catalyst like platinum will reduce that transition state energy a little bit, but nothing like what an enzyme will do. So how does an enzyme do something different from what a chemical catalyst like platinum does? Right? Well, the answer turns out to be something that you've already studied and learned. Enzymes are flexible. Enzymes are flexible. It's the flexibility of enzymes that allows the enzyme to perform the magic that it does. Flexibility. Okay. We'll talk later about um, an enzyme called hexokinase. It's one I usually like to give as an example. Hexokinase catalyzes the first reaction in the metabolism of glucose. To do so, what hexokinase has to do is it has to take glucose and it has to take some ATP, and it has to transfer the ATP from, uh, I'm sorry, transfer a phosphate from the ATP onto glucose. All right? If I wait for that to happen inside of a test tube by just simply mixing ATP and glucose, it will take a heck of a long time to happen because the ATP over here has to bump into glucose in exactly the right orientation and then separate in order for that process to occur. All right? And so I wait a long time. For, there's going to be many times they're going to hit. They're going to be in the wrong orientation. The phosphate's in the wrong place. They're upside down. They're backwards or whatever. So many, many interactions that happen in the absence of a catalyst are non-productive. The enzyme does two things to ensure that this re reaction occurs. First, the enzyme has on it a specific binding site for glucose. It also has a specific binding site for ATP. And schematically, if we were to look at them, they look kind of like this. Okay? Enzymes, as I said, are flexible. They orient things so that the, a the, the glucose is positioned perfectly up here on the top, and the ATP is positioned perfectly here on the bottom, such that the binding of the two causes a small shape change. You've seen small shape changes happen in hemoglobin, right? The small shape change that happens is this. The phosphate is placed immediately next to the glucose. Doesn't have to accidentally get there. And then, as the phosphate jumps from one to the other, another shape change happens. The jaws open. When the jaws open, they let go of the substrates, and guess what? You've done exactly what you would be waiting a long time in a test tube to have happen. 
Enzymes have specific binding sites, and enzymes have specific 3D orientations that allow the substrates, and by the way, the substrate is what the enzyme is catalyzing a reaction on. They allow the substrates to be in perfect position to react. Chemical catalysts cannot do that. They don't have flexibility. They don't have binding sites. Yes, sir? How do the substrate binding into the enzyme cause the enzyme to bend? By the very same mechanism that the binding of oxygen inside of hemoglobin caused hemoglobin to change shape slightly. We'll see inside of enzymes that sometimes the bends are actually pretty big. All right? and your question is, how does that happen? All right? Imagine, if you will, when you bind a substrate, what are you changing inside of that enzyme? What's going what's to cause a substrate to bind? Various types of bonding. So you could have hydrogen bonding, you could have hydrophobic bonding, and so forth. And as you do that, you're changing the electronic environment of the enzyme itself. As you change the electronic environment, when you think of electronics, what do you think of? Charge. And when you start thinking about how charges change, you start thinking about how those interactions that stabilize the enzyme change, and now you start thinking that the enzyme is going to adapt to that. That's exactly what happened in hemoglobin, and that's exactly what's happening inside of an enzyme. Does that make sense? Pretty cool stuff. Other questions? OK. Now, I'm going to spend, uh, actually, probably next week, uh, some time talking about mechanisms of catalysis. So I've just given you a little taste of the mechanisms of catalysis. What I'm going to spend some time on now, and probably for the next couple of lectures, is I'm going to spend some time talking about what we call the kinetics of an enzymatic reaction. Kinetics relating to speed, movement. Okay? That's what I'm going to talk about here. Okay? And what you're going to see as I talk about this is you're going to see some things that look kind of like what hemoglobin was doing. All right? Kind of like what hemoglobin was doing. Here is um, an example of the type of kinetics that we study with enzymes. One of the things that we're interested in studying in enzymes is the reaction velocity. Because you've already seen enzymes can be pretty remarkable in how fast they can do things. We want to understand how that velocity of reaction can uh, be studied. All right? Well, if I say velocity to you, uh, thinking about driving around in your car or riding on your bicycle or jogging or walking or whatever, we think about it's a rate. It's a distance divided by time. 50 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, three steps per second, right? There's something having to do with a rate. When we talk about an enzyme's velocity, we're not talking about movement. We're talking about reaction. So what do enzymes do? They catalyze reactions. They take substrates, and they convert them into products. So for an enzymatic velocity, we need to understand the rate of formation of product. The rate of formation of product. Okay. Enzyme velocity is equal to the concentration of product over time. The concentration of product over time. That's pretty straightforward. That's expressed as molarity per second, molarity per minute, millimolarity per second, millimolarity per minute. That's what the velocity component is. How would I measure velocity? Well, well maybe I should tell you more about how I would produce this plot right here. Okay? Velocity is one thing I'm interested in. If you look at this plot, what you see is that the velocity goes up as the substrate concentration goes up. That's not totally surprising. Let's imagine I've got an enzyme sitting over here. And this enzyme is sitting here waiting for a substrate to, bound, to, to bind to it and then to uh, be converted into product. All right? If the enzyme is sitting here waiting for a period of time before the substrate gets close to it and before the substrate binds to it, the enzyme is wasting its time. Right? If I have 
If I add and increase the substrate concentration so that I've got 10 times as much substrate as I had in the first situation, then I would have a 10 times more likelihood that the enzyme and the substrate would bump into each other and the enzyme could catalyze a reaction. Intuitively, it means that the more substrate I have there, the more likely the enzyme is going to bind to it and the more likely a product will be formed. Okay. When I do that, I see that as I increase the substrate concentration, this plot occurs. That looks kind of like what we saw with myoglobin, binding to oxygen. We saw what we call, I didn't give it a, a name at the time, but I'll give it a name here. We saw a hyperbolic plot. Myoglobin's binding plot for oxygen is hyperbolic. And this plot that I've just described to you, which is called velocity versus substrate concentration, this is also a hyperbolic plot. Well, you see there's something on this graph that says maximum velocity. It says that this is going to reach a maximum and then it's not going to go any faster. Why is that? Well, I like to compare enzymes to factories. All right? A factory that makes automobiles takes substrates which are just simply parts for assembling a car. It takes substrates, it takes the parts for a car, and workers work on assembling those automobiles. And when they're done, they have a finished product, an automobile. A factory has a given capacity. If you give a factory an excess of parts, if you give it way more parts than it needs, it still can't produce them any faster because adding more and more parts to that total that they've got won't change how fast the workers can put everything together to make that automobile, right? If I'm short of parts, right, and the supplier is kind of dribbling them to me and I'm getting them at a very slow rate, that really could affect me at the low end where, well, we're twiddling our thumbs waiting for parts to get here, right? But at the high end, I run into a maximum. This is what enzymes do. Enzymes run into maximum because we can increase the substrate concentration as much as we want, but once we get it to the point where as soon as a reaction is done, another substrate is there, we can't make it go any faster than that. Right? So enzymatic reactions will have a maximum velocity. Everybody with me? Maximum velocity turns out not to be a characteristic of an enzyme. That may seem a little cockeyed to tell you that, but it, it means it's not a characteristic of an enzyme. When I say it's not a characteristic, what does that mean? It means that the velocity of the reaction is not something inherent to the enzyme. It's inherent to how many enzymes I have. If I take General Motors and I've got, I'm assembling an automobile and I have one factory that produces uh, GMC trucks, the number of GMC trucks that's going to come out is going to be the maximum velocity of that GMC truck factory. If I make another factory that makes trucks and it has the same rate as the first factory, my velocity of making trucks is going to double, right? I can produce twice as many trucks because I've got two factories that are working on that. As long as they have enough stuff to use, they will produce twice as many trucks. If I make three factories, I'll have three times as many. Enzymes are the same way. If I have a given velocity for a given amount of enzyme, and I double the amount of enzyme, I'm going to double the amount of maximum velocity. So maximum velocity, if I'm going to talk about it, really has to be related to how much enzyme did you use, Ahern? You got to think about that. So maximum velocity is not inherent to an enzyme, it's inherent to a concentration of enzyme. It's for that reason maximum velocity is not used, it's not any good for comparing enzymes. I can't compare the velocity of one enzyme with another enzyme because, again, it's dependent upon the concentration of the enzyme. Well, I would like to be able to compare enzymes, so what can I do to compare them? In order to do that, what I need to do is I need to 
take into consideration the concentration of enzymes. All right? I'm going to give you a term that um, uh, allows you to understand that, okay? And that is, where did it go? I've lost it. I'll tell you what it is. Okay? It's called KCAT. KCAT is related to the maximum velocity, but it takes the enzyme concentration into consideration. KCAT is equal to the maximum velocity. By the way, maximum velocity is also abbreviated Vmax. Vmax is maximum velocity. KCAT is equal to Vmax divided by the concentration of enzyme that you used. Now, you've taken into consideration the enzyme concentration. And because of that, you've reached something that is a property of a given enzyme. KCAT can be compared between enzymes. When I showed you the table earlier today, what I was showing you in comparing those enzymes were KCATs. That's KCAT right there. The units on KCAT are per second. That's the units. What it translates to is molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. So something that has a KCAT of 1 million means that each molecule of enzyme is catalyzing the formation of 1 million molecules of product per second. Well, I can say that this enzyme down here, carbonic anhydrase, is working a heck of a lot faster than any of these other enzymes because I've taken the, con the concentration of enzymes out of the equation. Make sense? Everybody understand KCAT and the difference between KCAT and Vmax? No? If you don't, this is a good time to ask. Yes. So, yeah, I was trying to do the big man summary so much. Um, it's Vmax over, could you also call that the molarity, the concentration of product? That's what you called it earlier, or is it not the concentration of product? It's the concentration KCAT of product. is not a molarity. KCAT is, is a rate, and it's a rate of product per, react, per, per, um, sub, <coughs> per enzyme per second. All right? Product per enzyme per second. Vmax was a molarity. Vmax was. Uh, a molarity per second, right? And that was molarity of product per second or per minute or whatever, right? So it's a very good question that she's asked here. Well, what happens in the molarity term? Well, what do we do? We divided concentration of product by the concentration of the enzyme and the concentrations disappeared. We were simply left with a number. And that's why it's number of molecules per uh, uh, molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per time, per second, okay? So that's what happened to the molarity term. We took it out of the equation. Yes? The units of KCAT are just per second or per minute or whatever we define, yeah, as time. Okay, so KCAT turns out to be a really useful term for us to understand enzymes. Okay. All right, now, um, since I'm on the topic, I'm jumping around a little bit here today. Since I'm on the topic, I'm going to also introduce another term to you, and I'm gonna say more about these uh, next time, and that is a term known as KM. Okay, this shows you that graph I was talking about earlier, but it shows you in a little bit more detail, and I also wanna do two things here. One is to come back and tell you about how we make such a plot, and number two, what's useful and, uh, useful and informative for us out of that plot. Please note that we always calculate Vmax. We have to calculate Vmax in order to calculate KCAT. KCAT doesn't just jump out at us. We've got to calculate KCAT from our Vmax. So we have to first determine Vmax and then divide by the concentration of enzyme that we used. All right? Well, first, let's talk about how we make this plot. If I want to make this plot, I'm going to do an experiment and I'm going to do an enzyme kinetics experiment. I'm going to take, let's say, 20 different tubes 
of reaction that I'm going to study. All right? All the tubes are going to have enzyme. All the tubes are going to have buffer. Okay? And to each tube, I'm going to add a different amount of substrate. Low concentration of substrate, high concentration of substrate, okay? And varying concentrations of substrate in between. I let the reaction go for a fixed period of time. And if I do this right, I try to do it for a very short period of time. The reason I do it for a short period of time is that I don't want my reaction to come to equilibrium. What happens at equilibrium? Here's a good question for those of you who know something about equilibrium. What happens at equilibrium? The forward reaction equals the reverse reaction. I don't want to study the reverse reaction. I'm interested in the velocity of this reaction. I want to see what's going forwards. I want to study this before I get to equilibrium because if I get to equilibrium, I'm not going to see anything happen. So I want to study this very early. So I usually study this for a very short period of time before product has much of a chance to accumulate. If product accumulates too much, then I'm going to start studying the reverse reaction. That's not going to tell me anything. Make sense? Okay. Now, you've learned how it is that we make a plot like this. All right? This graph has one other thing on it that we need to understand. That's what I'm going to finish with for today, and I'll say more about it next time. We've learned a very important parameter about enzymes. That was KCAT. This thing I'm getting ready to show you is another important parameter about enzymes. And it's, called, it's called KM. All right? It's also called the Michaelis constant. What KM tells us that's very valuable is the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. What is affinity? Affinity is what you have for your significant other. That's a joke. Okay? Tight binding, all the various things that you can think of here, right? All the metaphors you want to have, all right? If you really like your significant other, you may have more affinity than if your significant other is like not so significant, right? Okay? You understand what I'm talking about, okay? I'm going to tell you the answer and then I'm going to tell you how we get to this next time. The answer to this is something that has high affinity has a low KM. Something that has low affinity has a high KM. We measure affinity by measuring the concentration, the concentration that it takes for a reaction to get to half of Vmax. We measure the concentration of substrate that it takes to get a reaction to half of Vmax. Why don't we measure the concentration it takes to get to Vmax? There's no such thing. This concentration will get me to Vmax. This concentration will get me to Vmax. This concentration over here on the wall will get me to Vmax. There's no one concentration. But there is a specific concentration that will get me to half of Vmax, and that's something I can measure very readily. And this tells me something about the enzymes affinity for its substrate. We'll pick up at that point next time. Thank you.